thank you so much. So we've had a great introduction to uh, some of the problems and some of the solutions. And I know that uh, as I've been talking to over the break with people, people are interested in connecting the dots. So that's what we're going to do. Talk about some links. OK. Now, we know what we're not going to do, right? We have this global <laughs> environmental crisis. We have the, the two sides of it, two important parts of it, the biodiversity crisis and the global climate crisis. We're not just going to say, well, we won't do anything, right? Uh, why worry about biodiversity? We're not going to worry. Uh, or we're not going to just sit around and say, well, the climate, yeah, it seems like the weird stuff is happening. That's the way it goes. No, we're going to do something positive. So because we're focused on landscaping here, I think that uh, it's really uh, important to, again, point out how much of a positive impact we can have by choosing environmentally conscious landscaping. And this can address both issues. OK, uh, there we are. Uh, my colleague, uh, Frank Nicoli, down at the um, uh, Foothill College, uh, addressing that <laughs> question. So let's take biodiversity first. There are many components, as you may know, of biodiversity. And if we're thinking about all the species on planet Earth, we can see that there are plants, there are animals, there are fungi, there are bacteria, there are virus, all of the virus aren't living, I guess. <laughs> we have to, uh, algae. OK. And of uh, the animals, which are the majority, uh, the vast uh, majority of the animals are insects. So we really do have to think a little bit about, more about the insects. Now, not only are they important components of biodiversity, they happen to be the links uh, that join different parts of ecological communities. So I have to give a real shout out, a, a real uh, thank you, big thank you, to all the people who these many years have been focusing on pollinators as being really, really important connections uh, in communities. And this is our, uh, one of our important native pollinators here, our, our little uh, anthidium uh, on a cecilia flower there. But now here's the point that I want to emphasize from this minute on. We have to move beyond pollinators, folks. Yeah. It's time to, to go out and say, yes, we really appreciate the giant step forward that everybody has, has made focusing on pollinators. But pollinators themselves are a small portion of the total uh, diversity of, of, the, of the world around us, especially the insect world. And there are lots of other links that we have to focus on, both in the land, in the soil, uh, in the water. Lots of those links are insect. And I think Dan mentioned the insect apocalypse. A lot of people are concerned about that. Shortly after that, the study came out uh, documenting how North America has lost 30% of its birds since 1970. And there's a link here, and the links might be insects. OK, probably are. OK, so what are What's the link between, say, the birds and uh, and the, uh, what, are the what are the what are the the insects linking the birds to the plants? Okay, so the native plants support native insects and lots of other species as well. Here, for example, are some of our native marin insects you may not have seen: the manzanita looper, famous, right? <laughs> the uh, coyote brush uh, leaf beetle, beautiful. Uh, the madrone leaf miner. Oh, so you can see his little head in there. OK, uh, the toy on lace bug. Yeah, all of our heroes here. OK. Now, non-native plants, although they're, they're fine, they support uh, much less in the way of our data biodiversity. So here's uh, an OK group of trees, uh, but it, they're exotic trees. Uh, and therefore, they're not going to support the same amount of biodiversity as our native trees would. I, 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 maybe I shouldn't use this term, but I think of them this way. I, think, I, I call these the cemetery trees. Uh, they don't really support very much of our local diversity. Now, some of these other plants can be very beautiful, and we shouldn't exclude them, but uh, we just have to make sure that we have the right proportions. And so we have a ginkgo and, and a, and a um, crepe myr myrtle there. And OK. And other plants, they're OK in their particular surroundings. Oops, what happened here? Uh, we lost. Oops. Oh, and then we have our lawns. And our lawns are okay in some places, but you know they really don't support our native biodiversity either. So, uh, oh, another cemetery street. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, you might say, well, that sounds reasonable, but are there really any comparisons? And yes, we do have some comparisons. We need more. Uh, now, anybody know what this plant is? French broom. Okay, is it good landscaping? It was considered to be 
a good landscaping back in the 1950s. I don't know if you know the story. There was a group of neighbors in Mill Valley who every um, weekend they could would go out to Mount Temple Pius and plant this plant because they thought the mountain looked a little drab and it needed uh, beautification. And that was, I mean, we shouldn't judge them by our current standards. That was the thinking uh, of people who were interested in landscaping back in the 1950s. Landscaping ideas have changed. Yes. And this particular plant actually gave us a great opportunity at the College of Wren to do some comparisons. So, in fact, some of the students have participated in this project maybe here. So, Jan, I think, talked to also about how a lot of the work that needs to be done should, can be done by uh, efforts involving many people. We talk about citizen science, community science. And so, we had this uh, comparison of uh, French broom plants and nearest uh, neighboring native shrubs conduct, carried out by the College of Marin Entomology classes over a number of years, and we recorded the number of species, the number of, uh, a number of individuals, and this is really the very simple uh, summary, uh, certainly a lot more species and a lot more individuals on the native plants and on the broom. The real picture is a lot more, a lot more interesting. And uh, the paper is supposed to be out next month, which is tomorrow. So <laughs> if you want more detail, just let me know and I'll send you a copy. Uh, OK, we do also have information on which of our native plants support a lot of insects. Of course, we haven't surveyed every one of our native plants here in Marin. But the, ch the early champion in the Bay Area was coyote brush, partly because that was what the um, Stanford researcher <laughs> decided to focus on way back in 1950. And he totaled up 200 plus species, and then additional flower visitors, then were 55 more species, and there may be more than that. Okay, okay. I, I think I should get a few more minutes because I started five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in charge. <laughs> Is that okay? You're fine. Okay, okay. And uh, so we have the, we have the coast live oak also. Um, that, and, and I think one thing you can check here: a lot of these species are doing very many different things. That, that's additional details. Coast live oak. Uh, one, spe one individual tree uh, was found to have over 20 species of caterpillars uh, at Alpine Lake in April. Uh, uh, Jared Collard, Lucy Griffith, did that study. And then California Oaks in general may support 5,000 species of insects in their Wow! Okay, what's going on here? Okay, um, okay. There's my thumb. My thumb may be too, oh, too heavy or something. Uh, our toy on has been found, uh, I think, 400, 409 species have been collected from it. Uh, we're, not, we're not sure how many are, are strictly depending on it. And then we get to the overall landscape situation. This is the Ross Valley. Uh, we have mixtures of things. And uh, Doug Tallamy, who works over in, in, in the eastern United States, did some calculations and found that up to 30% of non-native plants are okay by volume. That doesn't impede the, uh, the wildlife biodiversity. So one idea that I'm suggesting here is that natives be the background default uh, for landscaping. And then both native and introduced non-invasive species can be used as accent plants. And so we have some wonderful examples of that here in Marin. Uh, first one was up in Nevada, Charlotte Targavis and Targavis Garden, College of Marin, uh, these College of Marin shots, uh, the Sausalito uh, Habitat Garden there, and another College of Marin shot. Now, just to finish up and, and emphasize that we can link these, uh, these different, uh, apparently very different subjects, we talked, I think uh, Diana talked about the carbon dioxide uh, uh, in the atmosphere and the carbon cycle. And okay, we have burning and decomposition putting it in and, and photosynthesis taking out the classic carbon cycle. But time scales are important. So, yeah, okay, so if we are taking, again, photo, uh, carbon out of the atmosphere with annual plants, it could be less permanently sequestered than if we're taking it out with perennial plants. And then a oh, beautiful um, non cemetery street with um, woody plants, native plants. And decomposition on a very large scale, people are worried about the uh, uh, permafrost melting and not only carbon dioxide, but methane being reduced. It could really cause a problem. Over, that stuff was sequestered over, um, over uh, millions of years. Uh, but short scale decomposition is not going to be such a big problem as, as in compost uh, heaps. Uh, okay, burning, some people are concerned, uh, of course, about the burning of fossil fuels. They should be, because these fossil fuels were sequestered over millions of years and we're burning them too fast, okay? But what about uh, the wildfires, what about prescribed burns? Not necessarily a big problem in the global carbon cycle as long as we get regrowth. And so if we have fire adapted vegetation and there's regrowth happening, 
that can bring the carbon back out of the atmosphere. Okay, what about the big hypothesis that unites, the general principle that unites these things? Intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Disturbances of moderate intensity and frequency are, are what maximize biodiversity. So this can be uh, cutting, this can be fire, this can be flood. But intermediate, uh, we're trying to figure out what is intermediate fire. There's been a lot of discussion about that. Uh, people are doing prescribed burns, uh, different kinds of uh, fuel thinning treatments. But my question to the landscaping community then is what would be the equivalent in terms of pruning and replacement of plants in landscaping? So it's taken us a long time to figure out that, yeah, uh, absolute zero fire, fire suppression is bad because then you get giant wildfire catastrophes. Uh, can we get to some intermediate uh, fire frequency and intensity? Can we do that with, with pruning and replacement of plants also? Uh, maybe so. <laughs> okay. So let's put everything together consciously and achieve a balanced world. And again, I, I want to finish up here with a Doug Tallamy contribution. Uh, in the past, maybe people have not had a balanced concept of landscaping. They haven't put in all the variables. Now we can put in all the variables and have a more balanced situation. Okay. I think that's it. We have some resources here too. Uh, and I think I did it, right? <laughs> <laughs>